Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. In today's geopolitical storms, we're all deeply affected by the media. We're flooded with other people's opinions, we're shocked by images, and we're pressured to align with the demands of one group or another. Today, we'll discuss Jung's struggles as he tried to understand war and its aftermath. We'll explore how cultural inferiority makes us vulnerable to splitting, how individuation and self-knowledge can help us be objective, and the great value in asking ourselves, what is my role in this global event, not what news commentators assign us? Afterwards. We'll analyze two amazing dreams about sharks. So stay with us to the end. Well, uh, this is our uh, our really uh, experiment in delving into one of Jung's essays, and uh, he wrote this essay right after World War II, of course, and. What really struck me at the outset, a page and a half or so in, is when he said, I must confess, no article has ever given me so much trouble. And uh, it really um, affected me that the topic that he's dealing with is uh, so psychologically heavy, uh, so big, uh, especially right after World War II and all the devastation of to try to just write an article about something so massive um, affected Jung. And he starts with uh, the concept, and he's careful to call it psychological concept, of collective guilt. And uh, he relates it to the polarity of superiority and inferiority. He calls it a psychic phenomenon It spreads itself over the whole neighborhood, village, country, and Europe. And this is straight Jung. So what do we want to say and how can we understand collective guilt? Well, just to say for a second uh, that, you know, he says right in the beginning, people are are asking me for an explanation. So mm-hmm. you can just, you know, he's writing this, like we said, in 1945. Reconstruction hasn't even started yet. People are saying, what happened? How did this happen? Yeah. Uh, he says, this calls for reflection. People are showing up on my door saying, you know, Dr. Jung, what can you tell us? Yes. And he he's really struggling with it. So it's, it's I think for me, it was just, um, you know, rereading this essay for the fourth or fifth time, uh, just take, taking in just how close to the events he was at this time in time. And uh, so how difficult it would be to fully be able to get a perspective on them in any way. But yeah, but yeah, the, the part about collective guilt really struck me too um, on, on this reading uh, th- that, that, Basically, we're all implicated, and and especially as Europeans. You know, he says, um, the world <laughs> sees Europe as a continent on whose soil the shameful concentration camps grew, just as Europe singles out Germany as the land and the people that are enveloped in a cloud of guilt. For the horror happened in Germany, and its perpetrators were German. No German can deny this any more than a European or a Christian can deny that the most monstrous crime of all ages was committed in his house. Yes. The Christian church should put ashes on her forehead and rend her garments 
on account of the guilt of her children. The shadow of their guilt has fallen on her as much as upon Europe, the mother of monsters. Europe must account for herself before the world. Yeah. And he says at some point in the essay, you know, this just happened a few hundred miles from where Jung lived. Yes. And that trying to isolate it, you know, he, you know, the, the, the Swiss or the French or other European nations could say, hey, it wasn't us, it was the Germans. But that's not how it works. Of it, Europe is an entity. Um, it's in our neighborhood. Uh, it's part of European culture. Uh, and so we can't just lay the blame on somebody else, whether it's an individual or another country. And he also says, are we not all a little ashamed? And um, well, yeah. be because we all want to think well of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And our shadow can't possibly be that dark, can it? It might be dark for those other people, but not us. It's a lot to take on, this concept of collective guilt, and that we're all, we're all connected. Jung says, no man lives within his own psychic sphere like a snail in a shell, separated from everybody else, but is connected with his fellow man by his unconscious community. So mm -hmm. no crime is ever an isolated psychic happening. So Jung is already sitting in a really difficult problem, is that something terrible has happened, and people are mm -hmm. coming to him as a leader, as mm -hmm. somebody who is a, a wisdom figure, and asking him, how do we hold this? How do we understand this? How do we survive these feelings and images and events? And he's beginning to struggle to, to use his idea of the collective psyche mm -hmm. in a way to frame things that happen in the collective, things that happen on such an enormous scale. And he himself is trying to sit in this place that there is a collective human soul and the terrible suffering that happens in one place happens in the human soul in all places. And when he sits mm -hmm. in that, in that attitude, he feels, you know, something terrible inside of himself, this terrible mm -hmm. sense of guilt that the human spirit has yep. participated in something that is so terrible and excruciating and painful. Yeah. And what does what does one do, or how does one even think from that perspective? And we can hear him really fighting with that, or or trying to figure mm. out what that might mean to him. Yeah. And he's very careful to distinguish collective from individual. You know, he said we have to distinguish between the individually guilty and collectively guilty. So, you know, he's not, you know, uh, making that kind of global uh, assessment of guilt. But I think mm -hmm. you're right of what and how is there a collective, and it goes to his concept of the collective unconscious, of where we have so many basic constructs forms, archetypes, mythological images, etc., in common, and that we all affect one another. Right. And he talks about it, and so that's at the collective level, and at the individual level in the consulting room, we, we have between two people, and I think almost everybody has experienced this, the unconscious to unconscious connection, where I just know what somebody's going to say, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, just uh, this weekend, I I had a feeling that um, one chunk of the family was arriving, and, and I was out getting something in the garage, and I just stood in the driveway, and then there they were. 
So we all know there's an unconscious to unconscious connection and it is individual and familial and global. Mm -hmm. And, and the tendency when we feel this collective guilt is to want to deny our mm -hmm. culpability yep. and project our shadow so that it's mm -hmm. these, you know, terrible people out there over there who did this. And of course, you know, there's, there's some truth to that. Yeah. But uh, we want, what we want to split off is the knowledge that um, that could have been me. Hmm. And, and I think that that is very dangerous. It's very dangerous to split off from the knowledge that that could have been me. Well, say more about that. Well, uh, you know, I think that when something terrible happens in the world and we want to say, well, it's being done by those terrible people over there, uh, we make we make we make them into monsters, and then uh, whatever we do is justified. So Jung talks at some point about the the carpet bombing of of Germany, and I mean I, I'm not I'm not a military historian, and I you know perhaps that was actually the the right thing to do, but there was tremendous suffering visited upon the Germans mm -hmm. and ger German civilians as a result of that. Um, and, and, uh, you know, again, these are, these are difficult, these are difficult, you know, in some sense, military and strategic decisions that I don't feel, uh, uh, qualified to weigh in on, but, but, on, but on a certain sense, uh, when we, when we turn, uh, when we, when we, we turn someone into any group into a monster for any reason, split off our, our shadow, say, they're the ones that are evil. They're mm -hmm. the ones that are doing this. We, we, we monster them, dehumanize them, and then uh, whatever we do uh, to them becomes justified. Yeah. So, you know, it, it goes back to that um, Solzhenitsyn quote that I um, probably go to uh, far too often on the podcast, but here it is. I'll say it again. If it were only so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, which I think is what Jung is getting at in his discussion of collective guilt. Mm -hmm. The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. So where is the evil in me? And can I sit with that? You know, I'm just, uh, as we talk, um, I'm really kind of really feeling the weight of this. Uh, and Jung says it's the dark cloud that rises up. And that the murder has been suffered by everyone, and everyone has committed it. It's a huge thing to take in that we are that connected with everyone else, and there are no bad guys out there. Wouldn't it be comforting and convenient if we could blame them, whoever that particular them happens to be? Uh, that it is us, and that we have to turn inward and really try our best, as monumental as it is, to to take that in. It's not like Jung gives Hitler or the Germans a pass in this essay, by the no, way. No, not I mean, at all. <laughs> um, but but to to be sitting this close to these events and to explore. You know what you were just talking about, Deb. Like how are how are we all implicated? It's a kind of a remarkable psychological position to take. Well, I, Go ahead, Joseph. I, I feel like there's there's a one of the things that Jung is doing in his essay is that he's moving the reader from place to place. 
And yes, of course, there is. We're summarizing some things rather quickly about shadow and where we should mm -hmm. place evil collectively in the human soul, as well as maintaining a certain moral position about what is acceptable and unacceptable. So, just sitting with the essay, he's telling us that even as he's trying to hold what has happened, he says, I noticed how churned up one still is in one's own psyche, how difficult it is to reach anything approaching a moderate and relatively calm point of view in the midst of one's emotions. And so I want to start there for a second, which is just how difficult it is just for a human being to sit in the face of catastrophic events, some of the things that we're seeing in the world right now, and what I would say is some of the things we're seeing that are reported, and many other ca catastrophic things are happening in the world, even right now in other countries oh, yes. that are not necessarily at the front of news in the United States. But to be able to first acknowledge the tumult inside of us, the subjectivity, how difficult it is mm -hmm. to even suppose that we can be um, balanced in all of this. And Jung is sitting in that first confession, which is that he's just fighting to be able to tolerate um, going in with to, to try to understand what has happened. As you said, uh, Lisa, earlier, that there is this feeling of collective guilt. And part of this is an idea that Jung had called participation mystique, that, that when we, as human beings, drop down into a diminished state of awareness, we have a tendency to get swept into these collective themes. We get swept into images and ideas in ways that we often don't even mm -hmm. realize until we've resurfaced, till we've gotten ourselves out of it for a moment. So right now, this is the state that all of us are in being saturated and overwhelmed by images and commentaries in news and media, that we're incredibly distressed, which exhausts the ego. Perhaps we've been scrolling through yes. multiple stories and images. We're up late. We're tired. And, and being in that state of exhaustion and fear actually pushes our psyches down. One yeah. of the ways that we are co-participating in the horrors in the world is that the images and narratives that are given to us are populating our personal imaginations. Mm. And there's an interview and someone who has suffered terribly in this current awful war situations tells their story. A million people are resting into the same narrative, are co-participating in the listening. And it's as if a million people are having the experience, but of course they haven't. They are entranced in a state of listening, which gives them a feeling that they are all having an experience through the narrative that's being given to them. Yeah. And Jung wants to bring that to our attention right in the middle, right in the beginning of his essay, to say that that imaginal sweep is very mm -hmm. hard to overcome in order to then create mm -hmm. a kind of somewhat philosophical or psychological stance that is unique to the individual. Yeah. And he says that, you know, that there's this contagion effect you know, from narratives, co-participation, all, all the rest of it. And he says, when crimes mount up, indignation may get pitched too high, and evil mm -hmm. then becomes the order of the day. 
Uh, and it, then he relates it to the play of opposites. And that when the opposites get split apart, uh, we get polarities of good, bad, right, wrong. Uh, and then we have what he says of something of the abysmal darkness of the world has broken in on us, poisoning the very air we breathe. And I like what you said, Joseph, about that the ego gets exhausted. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ego then does what the ego tends to do, which is categorize things of what is good, what is right, what is wrong, who's bad, uh, be because it's comforting to an exhausted and, by definition, limited ego. Joseph, I'm I'm appreciating what you said too about uh, how it it kind of populates our imagination. You know, mm -hmm. I I used to think that I mean, we live in this world where we can actually know about these terrible things that are happening on the other side of the planet. Before modern communications, we might not have any idea. You might just know what was going on in your community. And I and I used to very much think that it was sort of my moral responsibility to know about the terrible things happening. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not so sure anymore that that actually is a positive thing because I think that this this um, phenomenon that you've put your finger on, where it kind of populates us, it can seed in us a desire to 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 split off and uh, yeah. project. And, uh, and, and, and maybe, maybe that only makes the situation worse, you know, I mean, hopefully it calls forth compassion, but, but it also calls forth uglier things as well. And uh, maybe I'll just read a bit from the essay. This is um, paragraph 408. The wickedness of others becomes our own wickedness because it kindles something evil in our own hearts. Mm -hmm. The murder has been suffered by everyone and everyone has committed it. Lured by the irresistible fascination of evil, we have all made this collective psychic murder possible. And the closer we were to it and the better we could see, the greater our guilt. In this way, we are unavoidably drawn into the uncleanness of evil, no matter what our conscious attitude may be. Mm -hmm. No one can escape this, for we are all so much a part of the human community that every crime calls forth a secret satisfaction in some corner of the fickle human heart. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievably powerful and goes back to what we were touching on about how we co-participate in today's age of modern communication, thinking about our podcast just recently about social media, that we have narratives. We have personal experience narratives, news narratives, social media narratives. And uh, what and how do we choose and must choose what to participate in? And and that's a place um, where we really do have choice about how we differentiate individually from the collective. Which narratives? What's me and what's out there? What what am I really doing here? So it doesn't have to be some uh, sort of uh, esoteric concept about the collective unconscious. We're all dipping into this stream every single day, depending on what we watch, what we read, what we believe, what narrative we accept. That, well, that, and arguably, that falls to each of us. If you really listen to Jung, we're drinking from that stream, whether or not we're checking the news. Yes. Right? Because we, we are connected at this unconscious level. So, yeah. Well, and I think he's also saying which is very confrontive that that when we are observing something which is in that category of evil or violent or wantonly destructive it excites something in the human soul <sighs> just categorically and it's a very difficult thing for us to face because we have these defenses but millions and millions of people will go and see movies where 
uh, people are blowing the heads off other people or disemboweling them or, you know, do you like slasher movies or horror movies or military movies where somebody is, for whatever reason, whether it's set in a magical science fiction realm or whether it's, you know, terrible, nightmarish mm -hmm. movie, human beings show up to these Roman yep. Colosseum like <laughs> gory, yep. gory things. And while we can say that one thing is theater, which it is, and thank goodness, and something else is newsreel, what we have to really understand is that your unconscious mind is often not clear in the way that the ego is. Mm. This was an enormous discovery in terms of the power of psychotherapy, that if you imagine something with enough emotional intensity and clarity, your body and your personal unconscious will take it mm. as true. Now, this can be used to great effect in healing, for instance, in attachment disorders. One effective treatment is for people to begin to visualize an ideal parent somewhere mm -hmm. in their imagination that is providing them the warmth and guidance that they may not have had, that they may not have had in their lived life. And actually, their body and their personal unconscious will take that in as true and it mm -hmm. will be incredibly healing. Conversely, the millions of hours that are spent in games where people kill each other, in movies and other theater where war is depicted and glorified, your unconscious cannot differentiate that from newsreel. And what that means is in one environment, you'll call it entertainment and call it exciting and even say you love watching it. And when the collective says, oh, no, 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 but this has actually really happened. And the ego takes a distancing position. But what Jung is saying, mm -hmm. deep down, human beings are still equally as excited by violence and destruction. Yeah. And Joseph, I'll, I'll, I'll back up what you've just been saying with a, a brief quote from the essay. He says, has it never occurred to anybody, for instance, that the vogue for the thriller has a rather questionable mm -hmm. side? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the, you know, it's a question of how do we, each one of us, deal with this uh, when uh, I was raising kids, it was very much sort of the in liberal uh, viewpoint that you you didn't give your kids toy guns to play with. Uh, that it, as if that kind of was just eliminated, uh, it it would somehow uh, be be a good thing. So it's not about uh, something as simplistic as that. It's really the issue is, what am I doing and how do I deal with that side of me that wants to play this video game or see that movie or, or tune into the latest awful crime, uh, because plenty of them are going on in our world today, of, of what am I doing with this? What am I, how am I processing it? Of so we're back to the beginning of the essay where Jung says, we are called upon to reflect. We're called upon to become conscious. What am I doing? Why am I doing this? How am I dealing with myself? Uh, whatever we do, we do with ourselves, and we should be reflecting on it, uh, not just deciding certain things are right or wrong. Uh, otherwise, we're splitting ourselves. Right. Hello. I want to take just a minute to remind you all about Dream School. You can join Dream School now for 10% off by using the code HOLIDAY2023 at checkout. That's HOLIDAY with a capital H, 2023 
10% off Dream School. Now is the time if you've been thinking about it. And we have an exciting uh, new possibility. You can now give Dream School as a gift. So when you go to check out, there is an option that you can check to give Dream School as a gift. I think it's a perfect holiday present. Thanks. I want to move us along in the essay a little bit. I'm now up to uh, paragraph 412. <laughs> but to go back and make a point we've already touched upon, but it's just such a good quote. He says, do we seriously believe that we would have been immune? Yeah. Well, and uh, to make the point that I'm sure our listeners have already arrived at, it's not as if those things happened only in Germany. I think we have plenty of issues worldwide today. Uh, that, um, and that's why we're talking about this essay. Do we seriously Im believe that we are immune? You know, Jung goes on to talk about man being too uh, far separated from his instincts, which is a theme throughout his works. But what does he mean by, you know, our instincts? Uh, but he means from, from nature, from hands-on stuff, from living in a, a literally grounded way, which is why he built his other second home, Bowling Inn. He built it, a lot of it himself with his own hands. He was a stone carver. Uh, Lisa and I were fortunate enough to have seen it, and it's pretty primitive. Uh, you know, the part that visitors are allowed to see is this, the round stone tower and the kitchen, and it's pretty basic. So that is where he said he was most himself. Um, most of us are not going mm -hmm. to live like that, and we don't live like that. But what Jung is talking about is a separation from our essential nature and the distancing from ourselves that technology allows us to have. We live in cities, we take elevators, uh, public transportation, we drive cars. The list is almost endless, but we don't have the direct experience of, let's say, hunting for our own food, growing our own food. We're not close to nature. And that that, that, that uh, turns us into more dependent creatures. We're more dependent on the state. Because we're not uh, subsistence farmers. And I think that's really in interesting. He says, once a man is cut off from the nourishing roots of instinct, he becomes the shuttlecock of every wind that blows. I mean, that's got to be like one of these yeah. great kind of, you know, young mic drop quotes, you know? Yeah. And, and, and he does say this repeatedly in different ways. This is a particularly eloquent way of saying it, I think. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think you're, you're right, Deb, that it relates to how cut off we are from sort of the basics of, of life. But I think mm -hmm. even on a psychological level, too, it's like, are you in touch with what your gut says? Are yeah. you in touch with what your body says? When you have a decision to make, do you do you reach inside and ask a question of yourself? What really feels right here? And do you hold that question and let an answer come up? Or are you so cut off that you're going to just follow whatever comes across your TikTok feed? Right. Because we don't get our information in our bodies, you know, the way that we once did. Of, oh, it's raining out. Oh, it's cold. Oh, one of my animals is sick. I am. I have to move this herd of cattle from point A to point B. You, you're, you know, in an immediate sensate way, 
what needs to happen and what's going on. And it is radically different from getting something across your TikTok feed. That is so far from direct experience. And I like what you're saying, Lisa, that it calls us to say, uh, to reflect. And, and to ask ourselves, what does my body say? What does my heart say? Um, what is, how do I take a more objective stance and weigh this out with some, uh, some cognition, some reason, some additional information? It really calls on us to have a much fuller, more complicated, in-depth process with ourselves um, than it once did eons or not so many eons ago when the information was direct, sensate, and um, inarguable. Uh, what I'd like to also introduce is something that Jung is, is putting at that point in the essay, that there is something about a chronic experience of inferiority mm. that then makes one vulnerable to this collective manipulation and being swamped or overwhelmed by the voices that come to us from the collective. And in our time, that would be media, mm -hmm. the various media sweeps. And, and that sense of inferiority or collapse or inadequacy then makes us or seduces us into wanting to yield authority and particularly the internal mm -hmm. authority yeah. where I as an individual must research, discern, investigate in order to have as much of a personally informed position as is possible. And when we have a sense of being inadequate and inferior, then we will cede psychological authority to whoever is most yes. prominent in the culture. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, That's exactly. A very specific yeah. vulnerability that can get all of us in trouble. Yeah, or get us. Yeah, it's like we hand trouble. over responsibility for thinking yeah. and judging and deciding right. to uh, whoever kind of holds sway at the moment. And this, this Jung says in the essay, this kind of helps explain the rise of demagoguery. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that we, we cede the authority. Um, and here, here's a paragraph, you know, that I think applies, applied then and it applies now. Uh, all these pathological features, says Jung, complete lack of insight into one's own character, autoerotic self-admiration and self-extenuation, as compensation for the inferiority complex you were mentioning, Joseph, mm -hmm. leads, denigration, leads to denigration and terrorization of one's fellow men, projection of shadow, lying, falsification of reality, determination to impress by fair means or foul, bluffing and double crossing. All these were united in the man who was diagnosed clinically and hysteric. He's referencing Hitler here. Mm -hmm. and whom a strange fate chose to be the political, moral, and religious spokesman of Germany for 12 years. And then he says, is this pure chance? So it calls on each of us to go, what are we doing? Uh, who are our leaders? What constitutes leadership? Of, is this pure chance? I think all of us might have um, a list of people today who that might fit. But you know, it's interesting because in the same part of the essay, he talks about uh, obviously, you know, the importance of taking responsibility and not becoming dependent, not handing over your judgment faculties to someone else. And part of that is accepting our own guilt. Mm -hmm. So he says, if only people could realize what an enrichment it is to find one's own guilt, what a sense of honor and spiritual dignity. But nowhere does there seem to be a glimmering of this insight. Instead, we hear only of attempts to shift the blame onto others. So I think 
you know, in, in a way, really interrogating ourself and saying, well, yeah. how am I, how am I, where am I in this dynamic? Instead yeah. of constantly seeing uh, the blame as belonging out there. Yeah. Uh, that, that the tendency to just um, split off our own awareness of blame um, actually sets up this path to demagoguery. Right. That's what he's and saying. He, and he says, to uh, add to what you're saying, Lisa, the German people, but it could be anyone, would never have been taken in and carried away so completely if this figure had not been a reflective image of the collective German hysteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, th I think, um, again, it calls on us to reflect and to be able to take in our own guilt rather than uh, splitting it off and projecting it onto a, a, a leadership figure uh, that allows us to escape our own internal condition of guilt. You know, that term, Deb, that collective hysteria, that is a really interesting term. Mm -hmm. And he he talks about it and, and kind of describes it some in this essay. But mm -hmm. even if we just sort of... Uh, <laughs> think about it evocatively. I mean, we're not we're not really using it as a diagnostic category. But what do we think of when we think of that term? I mean, I'm I'm thinking of you know just two things that came across my newsfeed this morning. That there were uh, three young Palestinian Americans walking home from Thanksgiving, and they were I think this was maybe in Maine. Someone just pulled up alongside them and shot them dead. There were three brothers. They were just <sighs> executed. Uh, and uh, another another thing that came across my newsfeed is a school, I believe it was in Brooklyn, where there was a Jewish teacher who had to be locked into a room while the students um, uh, rioted, ripping things out of the walls, um, kind of going after her because she had been to a rally in support of, of Israel. Mm -hmm. And And so is this not collective hysteria and is it not incredibly dangerous? So here's a quote. Yeah. This condition can easily lead to an hysterical dissociation of the personality, which consists essentially in one hand not knowing what the other is doing, in wanting to jump over one's own shadow, and in looking for everything dark, inferior, and culpable in others. And he has italicized oh, yeah. those last two words yeah. that we want to look out there. I feel like I'm, this is the the drum I'm beating today is that we're always wanting to look out there for yeah. where, where's, where's the <laughs> yeah. evil. No, yeah. Look inside. Where, yes. where are you in this? And um, how important it is to look inside. I think um, maybe the drum I'm beating is related to yours, Lisa, uh, but that, that our own consciousness makes a difference. I think we concretize things and we say, well, but what could I do? You know, I'm just one person. What can I do? I'm living out here at the end of a dirt road on Cape Cod. What can I do? Mm -hmm. um, you, you can do a lot. The, your powers of self-reflection, consciousness, uh, doing some research, really thinking things over, examining yourself makes a huge difference. That's what you can do. That's what we can all do is look inside. It's not a nice, you know, sort of psychological cliche. Uh, each of us matters. And raising our own level of self-awareness matters. And Jung said over and over again that the way to change the world was basically, I'm paraphrasing, one person at a time. We are called upon to do our own internal work today as never before because we have so many destructive technological uh, powers at our hands, you know, f from guns to instruments of war. You look like you want to say something, Joseph. Oh. 
Well, I'd like to loop back in, in light of all that's been put, and come back to what we were saying about the capacity to withstand one's own guilt. Mm. Because when we talk about moving into hysteria, whether that's an individual or a culture, it is it happens because there is a lack of strength that facing our own experience of guilt or more broadly moving towards our suffering instead of away from it creates a kind of muscularity in the sense of the individual in order to say i feel guilty about something we have to reflect on how we may or may not have co-participated directly mm -hmm. or indirectly in the suffering that we are struggling to face. Mm -hmm. But whatever we discover in that inquiry, the ability to withstand suffering is the secret about strength. And when we feel mm -hmm. reduced in a substantive way, we often tell ourselves that we're not strong enough. That might be said subtly or explicitly. And when we lack that strength, then we are prone to split, to want to put all the blame somewhere outside of ourselves. And then we are incredibly vulnerable to political leaders who will back that up. We have political leaders that then say, well, you're absolutely right. You are blameless. Yes. And it's them. And we're going to take action to reinforce this feeling or this partial evidence that you are either totally victimized or totally blameless. And that all has to do with that collapse of personal strength. So as you and Lisa have been saying, you know, what are the ways that we develop strength? And as you were saying, Lisa, to be able to self-reflect, to be able to face our own shadow, which means to be able to face the things that we don't want to know about ourselves. Now, this is a process that is secondary to whatever terrible geopolitical tragedy is out there. We're talking about the things that mm -hmm. we fail at just within the 20 feet around us at any given mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. or in the last six months of our engagements with our families yeah. and friends, we don't have to look to archetypal situations or enormous overwhelming contexts. Yeah, There are wars that we are in the middle of in our families. We're at war about something in our workplace, and mm -hmm. we're often at war in our own minds about one thing or another. And as we face that, we suddenly become, not suddenly, I, I would rather say over time, we become more capable of holding internal tension. And then we can feel suspicious about leaders or anyone else who says, I can take that tension away from you. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It's... Uh, uh... I think I'm just looking at what you've said, Joseph, and looking at it uh, through a slightly different lens, but reiterating it. Of Jung says, psychological corrections can only be made in consciousness, and that without guilt, unfortunately, there can be no psychic maturation and no widening of the spiritual horizon. So that goes to us inside. And then he says, every demagogue exploits this human weakness when he points with the greatest possible outcry to all the things that are wrong in the outside world. But the principle and indeed the only thing that is wrong with this world is man. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that it could be said any better. And, you know, I wonder if we're all sort of circling around what is it that makes it so very, very difficult uh, for all of us uh, to do the work 
uh, that so clearly somehow needs to be done because all of us are distressed and grieving and sorrowing over so much in the world uh, that is creating so much suffering, as you said, Joseph. Uh, something is really trying to get our attention as individuals. This is the time, if not now, when? Well, you know, another another place that Jung goes in this essay, which he has spoken about elsewhere in the collected works, is how suggestibility, um, psychic epidemics, are especially dangerous, Deb, to your point about the, the yeah. danger being man, um, because we have lost, uh, we, we've lost these kind of overarching narratives, which, you know, I mean, the interesting thing is, you know, he talks about sort of uh, the gods being dead. But of course, when the gods weren't dead, they were responsible for a lot of death, mm -hmm. destruction, and war too. Somehow we have to come to terms with, with what it means to be creatures with a religious function, because Jung says mm -hmm. that we are, and I believe him. I think that's right. He says in this essay, now for the first time we are living in a lifeless nature, bereft of gods. No one will deny the important role which the powers of the human psyche, personified as gods, played in the past. The mere act of enlightenment may have destroyed the spirits of nature, but not the psychic factors that correspond to them, such as suggestibility, lack of criticism, fearfulness, propensity to superstition and prejudice, in short, all those qualities which make possession possible. Even though nature is de-psychized, the psychic conditions which breed demons are as actively at work as ever. The demons have not really disappeared, but have merely taken on another form. They have become unconscious psychic forces. Just when people were congratulating themselves on having abolished all spooks, it turned out that instead of haunting the attic or old ruins, mm -hmm. the spooks were flitting about in the heads of apparently normal Europeans. Tyrannical, obsessive, intoxicating ideas and delusions were abroad everywhere, and people began to believe the most absurd things, just as the possessed do. Mm -hmm. And again, I think we can see that he's accurately describing something mm -hmm. that happened in Europe in the 1930s mm -hmm. and 40s, but there's, there's plenty of evidence that similar things are going on now. And, and what do we do about this? It's it's not so easy to know. I think Jung struggled with whether or not there was some kind of a public opinion he should have taken, or whether or not he had a platform that could have, in some way, vaccinated the nation. Mm -hmm. And and of course, that left him with an enormous sense of guilt and personal suffering and personal inquiry. But what he comes to over and again is that it is unlikely that consciousness can be raised on a collective level because mm -hmm. the collective itself pushes yeah. against consciousness. Mm -hmm. That we exist in a collective experience because consciousness is dimmed. Mm. So all of the efforts which appear to be lifting us up if we all just did thus and such mm -hmm. inherently yeah. works against itself. Now, Jung had a very broad suspicion about any form of collective experience. He, mm -hmm. he stood very strongly against uh, communism, for instance, in as much as it seemed to um, entice or demand that people surrender their personal decisions over to uh, the government, and whether or not it was good or bad for the culture at large, his concern was about the independence of the human spirit. So anything that either demands that we surrender our independent thinking, feeling, and imagining, or that fate 
entices us to surrender our individuality is working against this liberation from being manipulated. And whether that's being manipulated by the unconscious archetypes, which have lost a kind of religious valence, or the mythologies or stories that would allow us to see them in one form or another, or whether it's financial stressors or the enticement of some kind of idealized outcome in the future, all of that surrendering is what he is standing against. Mm-hmm. And what he's saying, quite frankly, is we have to learn to talk about our inner life. We have to find the language to do that. We have to find the philosophies to do that. And we have to take the time to reflect in such a way that we have anything we can say that is truthful and honest. Yeah. I, th- I think that is uh, really insightful and important, what you just said. We have to find ways to talk to one another about our inner life. What is going on inside so that we learn uh, to be able to have a language, a spoken language, for things that are at a level of, of feeling, that are hard to articulate. And uh, we don't do it just uh, ourselves, uh, between me and me, or you and you. We do it with one another. What are you really thinking? What are you feeling? Uh, uh, To have those conversations. You know, in in one of his late essays, he, he talks, Joseph, about what you were just talking about, about the kind of collectivization of 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 people is so damaging and can lead us so far astray and mm-hmm. he says the antidote to this is is to really essentially to develop your own individual personal relationship with the transpersonal so he, he's very clear he's not talking about a dogmatic religion but that that's the factor that is protective and he says that at the end of this essay that we've been talking about today too mm-hmm. he says the question remains How am I to live with this shadow? What attitude is required if I am to be able to live in spite of evil? In order to find valid answers to these questions, a complete spiritual renewal is needed. And I think he's very much talking about a spiritual renewal on the individual level. Mm -hmm. He says the eternal truths cannot be transmitted mechanically. So you can't receive these from, you know, religious, dogmatic religious teachings. In every epoch, they must be born anew from the human psyche. So we have to have a kind of a direct experience of this. And Mm -hmm. that is the thing that is protective of, I want to say, of one's humanity. Mm -hmm. Uh, You you know, I've been thinking about um, something that the three of us are familiar with and and have loved as an image to to offer uh, of how this how does this work that if each of us does our work how does it affect the whole so what i'm thinking about is max zeller's dream and uh, max zeller went to see jung after world war 2 and uh he had been troubled about his his life and his vocation he was a psychoanalyst as the world was in a bad state. And uh, the morning that he was to leave, he had this dream and called Jung and said, oh my gosh, here's this dream. And uh, Jung said, come on over, let's talk about it. And I think it's a beautiful image uh, for all of us of how we participate in changing the world. Here's the dream. A temple of fast dimensions was in the process of being built. As far as I could see, ahead, behind, right and left, there were incredible numbers of people building on gigantic pillars. I, too, was building on a pillar. The whole building process was in its very first beginnings, but the foundation was already there, 
The rest of the building was starting to go up, and I and many others were working on it. And Jung said, yeah, you know, that is the temple we all build on. We don't know the people because, believe me, they build in India and China and in Russia and all over the world. And I find that image reassuring, comforting, and true. That going back to the concept of the collective unconscious and our unconscious to unconscious connection, if we all work on our pillar, um, the temple can be built and the foundation is already there. So, Deb, that's a, a beautiful and inspiring dream. Uh, we've had the wonderful good <laughs> fortune to know that and to talk about it. So, let's take a moment to imagine how, how could we help our listeners understand how to apply that? What would it mean for each of us to imagine that we are participating in the building of the new idea? which for Max Seller was this new temple. Mm -hmm. I mean, in one way, I think that Jung's comments to Max and his dream are reassuring, are soothing and calming, that despite the outer circumstance of the world, its hysteria, the terrible geopolitical things that happened, on and on and on, that there is a human spirit that is constructively imagining a better future. And I believe he said to Max, it would take a few hundred years mm -hmm. in his own intuition yeah. for this to emerge. So it's comforting. It might help us feel less distraught, less hysterical about things. And beyond that, Beyond that, what do we think is required? Yeah. Well, I don't know that I have sort of these actionable specifics, but what for me is heartening about it is that one's own process of individuation, of working on your own pillar, affects the whole and is part of the whole. Uh, which is what we've been saying, the capacity to reflect, the capacity to feel our own guilt of who are we at war with or what parts of ourselves might be, be at war with. Of the, that, that's building our own pillar, and that makes a contribution to growing the world. I also I also think that there's another aspect too, which is you know when I'm sitting with someone in a very very dark place in the consulting room, and and I am aware of feeling helpless, like I don't know what to do, mm. and the situation seems hopeless. I remind myself, as I think many Jungians do, that that there is a self that the person the person has a transpersonal center that Jung called the self. Mm. And it's not up to me to come up with the answer that I can, can trust that, that, that something in that person will activate in, in the right way. And, and, and so we, we often lean on that as analysts. And I think a similar thing applies here, that there, there is a process going on that we can't fathom that we're not in control of, that we can maybe only darkly discern, as Jung did through dreams, for example. But, but a sense of trust, perhaps, that we are being, we meaning, you know, humanity, is being carried along uh, in, in some way towards some yeah. development. So I, I take that as inspiring and comforting, mm -hmm. and it, which is important. Yeah. Yes. Because because when we fall into um, 
mind-numbing distress, even at the thought of something which is very far away from us in a personal sense, it might allow us to de-escalate, to kind of re-regulate ourselves or feel co-regulated mm -hmm. by the psyche. And in that moment, when our nervous system is calmer and our body is calmer, then we can think, and we can even think creatively. What can be done? What must be done? What could be done? Is this my work to do? And I think that that is such an important question. There is great work at all times to be done in this vast world. All three of us have training as social mm -hmm. workers. So we, we have a sensibility and a sensitivity to these collective systems where we are well acquainted with the role of advocacy and a policy mm. and, and, and the capacity for thoughtful systemic change. And, and some people are called to that. Some people do that well, some people do that less well. But we understand that there is a way to slowly shape systems with the hope that it will give rise to something better. Mm -hmm. So that is a piece of work one might do. But what I often will say to my analysands and to the students that I also work with is when you behold whatever is there before you, to then go back inside, and inside may be even just asking your physical body, mm -hmm. what is my part in this event? What is mm -hmm. my true and authentic response? And I know this may sound provocative to some of the listeners, but sometimes when we are saturated with horrifying pictures that we have seen in media, and we say, but what is my task at this moment? It may be to protect my children so that they are not overwhelmed by the things that they're seeing on TikTok, to actually keep my family safe and calm and thoughtful, because that is the scope of my reach today mm -hmm. or this month. Mm -hmm. Someone else may go inside and say, or discover, I'm going to shift my charitable donations because I believe that there are agencies that can intervene in the Red Cross and other organizations, and on and on. But what we must do is pull ourselves away mm -hmm from the kind of clockwork orange, mm -hmm. eyes pinned open, you know, being mm -hmm. programmed by some kind of media agency to pull back, turn away, breathe, pause, and pause, and pause again, and to ask your own spirit, what is my role at this time? in this place. And it may be to get very involved in something you've learned about, or it may point you in a different direction. And that is at the center of individuality. Mm -hmm. You have a unique destiny on this planet, and it is not determined by the news channel that you mm -hmm. are staring at all day long. Yeah, that's that's really great advice, Joseph, and, and very well put. And I think perhaps this is a good point at which we can switch to a dream. Today, we are going to consider two dreams. Uh, because they uh, both have to do with sharks, and we were intrigued. And um, 
So I'll read one. Lisa will read the next. Um, also, of course, uh, we have so many sharks on Cape Cod, now the mm -hmm. world's largest shark population. So um, here we go with something that has hooked us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, our dreamer for this dream is a woman, 24. She's a student, and she has entitled her dream, Shark Attack. And here's the dream. I discover a river inlet in the city I used to live in. I take the guy I am seeing there. He wants to go for a swim. But as I am telling him he shouldn't, as there are probably a lot of tiger sharks in there, he jumps in and swims out away from the jetty. He immediately gets attacked by a shark. I know I should jump in to save him, but I am too scared of the shark. I put my arm in the water and manage to grab the shark's tail and pull it back toward me. I poke the shark in the eyes as I know this is their weak spot, and I manage to pull the guy I am seeing out of the water. He has lost both his legs and an arm, and I am sobbing, asking him to please hold on. I call my mom to ask her what I should do, and she tells me to call an ambulance. I do, and he survives but he has lost both his legs and an arm. And for context, she says, I am currently living abroad and have become quite anxious and a little depressed. I'm struggling to do daily activities and I feel quite lonely, but incapable of doing anything to change this. Moving here and not having a stable base has brought up feelings of being lost in my life, of not knowing who I am or what I want to do, not knowing what my value is. She says the feelings in the dream were, I was so happy to discover the river inlet. I was excited to show it to my friend. When he jumped in and swam out, I was impressed by his bravery. During the shark attack, I was really fearful and ashamed afterwards that I didn't have the courage to jump in and shame him. And for additional context, she says, the city where I used to live was a really happy place for me. I loved my time there. The river inlet I discovered was a lot like the one I used to holiday at with my family when I was little. Only happy memories. But I do remember being fearful of sharks there, too. My associations with the guy are mixed. I think I really like him, but sometimes I'm unsure how I really feel. Hmm. You know, uh, one of the first things that comes up for me is this guy, and I, I have to say, I'm not sure if this is a real person in her life or just a guy. Do, do you guys have a lock mm. on that? Or we don't really know. It's a little unclear whether she's not sure how she feels about the dream figure right. or who or the dream figure represents. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, but in any case, here's this image of a, a kind of um, courageous, robust, masculine going out into the world kind of image, you know, this energy who then gets just horribly mutilated by, by these sharks. And, and it is possibly an image, uh, a kind of image of depression. So what happens when our kind of get up and go energy um, becomes mauled by sharks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and of course, you know, one of the one of the things uh, that that will be interesting in this discussion is what what a, what is a shark? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but in some sense, you know, being 24, being a little bit lost. I mean, I think a lot of people feel kind of lost at 24. Oh, yes, of course. It's, there's, it's a, a really important and often hard stage of yes. development. Yes. To, to be an adult mm -hmm. when you're still really very young. Well, uh, you, haven't, you haven't really found your way yet. No. And, and so uh, that... Yeah. that um, that energy that we have to put ourselves out there to jump into the water, mm -hmm. you know, can, can get pretty badly mauled. So I'm starting back right at the very beginning. I'm just taking a jump back here that mm -hmm. 
I discover a river inlet in the city I used to live in. And then she says in her comments, the city she used to live in was a happy place and it was a place where her family holidayed. Uh, so there is an inlet. There's a uh, uh, where the water flows in from the bigger, wider uh, sea, let's say. So something has made an incursion into uh, the city she used to live in, which was the happy place of holidays and childhood. The, the colder, shark-infested uh, aspect of the world um, is intruding uh, in the form of her dream image uh, guy she is seeing. And what happens when he jumps into the water? It's, it's pretty bad. The dream ego says, no, don't do it. But, you know, his bravery is um, not rewarded with success. No. Uh, the, the other place in the dream that I, um, you know, she's sobbing, he's lost both legs and one arm, is really uh, grisly and, you know, could hardly be much worse. And then the dream ego says, I call my mom to ask her what I should do. <laughs> Of, of, I think of a 24 year old who's living abroad and having uh, what seems to be a bit of a hard time there. Mm. And uh, the, the longing for uh, the maternal other to say, to take care of the situation, to come up with a solution. Yeah, and she does come up with a you know, the right mm -hmm. next thing to do, right? Call an ambulance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get some help. Yeah. So I'd like to take the dream uh, in one of two directions. One is just looking at it as a psychic situation where she's troubled by inner sharks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think the dream is also a comment on how she deals with intimacy. Mm -hmm. hmm. So. She has discovered an inlet, and she decides to take a fellow to meet her inlet. And when he sees this opportunity, yeah. this, this opening inside of her psyche, he jumps in to swim. He jumps uh -huh. into the relationship. He jumps into being a little more intimate and connecting, perhaps, to her on a deeper level on a oh. psychic level, on an unconscious level. And here, now, there's a fellow that's getting into the water with her, or into mm -hmm. her waters. And lo and behold, what happens is that there is a tremendously aggressive instinct that rises up inside of her that really goes after the guy that would dare jump into the, her waters. Mm-hmm. She has an enormous amount of power over the sharks. She can just reach the hand in, pull <laughs> one out, poke its eyes out, pull it away. If for whatever reason, and I'm not speculating on why there are sharks, there are many reasons we have sharks inside of us. But for this girl, there seems to be a confrontation that you're very lonely. But when somebody gets in the water with you, there is a kind of instinctive yeah. aggression and even predatory aggression that sees the other person as food or as prey. The ego is horrified by that. The ego doesn't want someone to get hurt, doesn't want somebody to be disabled around her, but yet something in the mm -hmm. psyche really goes after people and goes mm -hmm. after them in such a way that they lose their agency. That the guy survives, which, of course, somebody would not survive <laughs> yeah. having their limbs taken off. They would yeah. bleed out in two seconds. But this guy now has only one arm left with which to interact with her. So how many times have, have we met in Alisans who are deeply lonely and confused about why they're not in relationships, 
only to discover that there is a part of them that will not tolerate another person expressing their full agency, that somehow that can be deeply threatening or upsetting, mm -hmm. and that if somebody gets too close, we start cutting them into pieces. So there's only a one little way that they can make contact, one arm, one hand left with which to reach us. And the mm -hmm. deeper question is, why? Why do I feel so vulnerable? Why do I feel so ambivalent about having someone swim in my waters? Now, the fact that they're sharks means that they seem very, very alien and very far away mm -hmm. from the ego. But she does have control over them, and I think that's the real medicine in the dream. You can grab those darn sharks, you can mm -hmm. pull them away, you don't have to let them go after people who are trying to get close to you. There is a way forward. I think it's really interesting what, what you said, and I could see it applying not, not to other people, but how she treats parts of herself, too, that there's, that a, too. Yep. there's an inner energy. Um, let's move yeah. on to the next stream. I just want to make sure we have time. Um, and, and I just want to say that uh, I opened up our dream folder this morning, and there were these two dreams right next to each other submitted within hours, one called <laughs> Shark Attack, the other called Shark Skin. And uh, it just seemed like a, a natural thing to take both of them. So the second shark dream is by a different dreamer, a 39-year-old woman who is a psychologist, and the title of the dream is Shark Skin. She says, first, there was a part about overthrowing an oppressive regime by undermining a female associate of the dictator. In the next part of my dream, I was walking with the skin of a shark in my arms. It was a great white shark or something similar. I could carry it, although with much effort, as if it was a sturdy blanket folded over my underarms. The shark was comatose. If it were put in water, it would come alive and be whole again. I walked for days, sometimes putting it on a rod to hang it while I rested. <laughs> it was a heavy task. I felt at the same time love and fear for the shark. Towards the end of my journey, children and their teacher walked with me. It seemed that they came to see the shark in the water. The children were fooling around with the shark. They were not afraid. I tried to tell them it would be appropriate to fear the animal. We reached the destination by walking over a broad, straight, sandy road. Mm. It was a small building near the sea where the water was shallow at first. I hung the shark over a line before it would be put back in the water. I was glad this painful journey was coming to an end for both of us. I sat down on the wooden floor of the shack and looked at the animal. Then I woke up. And she says, I will start working at a new job soon after recovering from the remnants of a medical condition and a burnout that I developed after that. I had a terrible boss who pressured me to recover faster and humiliated me when I asked for help. I triggered some old trauma from my stepfather who passed away a year ago. I'm grieving the relationship of three years that ended in March of this year. I loved my girlfriend very much, but she had a disorganized attachment style, and I became quite anxious while we were together. I left because she was not a stable and loving partner for me. I'm excited to start a new chapter in my life, but I'm also afraid of what I could discover about myself. Maybe my role in my hardship has been larger than I feel it is, and I'm afraid of being or feeling rejected and treated badly again. I try to find out what I can do differently, but other than setting better boundaries, I do not know what else I can do. Also, a few days ago, there were elections in my country, and the vast majority voted for a conservative right-wing party, which pains me, but also does not surprise me. And she says, I felt strong and hopeful in the first part, as well as tense while taking risks. It felt necessary and possible to overthrow the regime. While walking with the shark, I could feel how heavy it was. I felt love and fear for the animal. 
I felt compassion and wanted for it to have a less painful fate. And I was anxious that it might still be able to hurt or kill me, even though it was comatose. Later, I felt concerned that the children were not careful and worried enough to stay unharmed by it. It felt nice to have the teacher around, to have a second adult to relate to. When I, felt, when I woke up, I felt sad for both the shark and myself. And finally, she notes, the first part looked and felt like an action movie with fast movements and dark spaces. My associations about sharks are dangerous, beautiful creatures, strong, vicious, deadly, mysterious in a way because they live in the sea and are so other. I remember as a child, I saw a documentary where divers go into the water inside a cage and these enormous sharks come circling around the cage. The association with the children is going on a field trip in elementary school. The kids were about six or seven years old. Mm. So here's our, uh, our synchronicity of a second shark dream. Very different from the first one, but I think there's some common elements. <laughs> I felt very interested in her observation that her previous partner had a disorganized attachment style. And one fast uh, pass over the dream, I'm wondering if the dehydrated shark <laughs> is somehow symbolic of the way that she has carried the relationship with a partner who was both dangerous mm -hmm. and loved, and that. She is still, as she mentions, processing something about carrying that. And if she's correct that she has a secure attachment, and she's had, again, this is a remnant of the relationship. It's, it's uh, dehydrated, so to speak, into a skin. But disorganized attachment-styled folks are caught between being deeply frightened of the caregiver and deeply anxious that they'll be abandoned. It's a very unworkable situation. So when the fear kicks up in the partner, they can become very aggressive because they perceive yeah. the caregiver or the other person as dangerous to them. And then when the other person naturally moves away because they're being aggressed, then there's a kind of panic that moves into mm -hmm. the partner. Correctly so that if you approach the partner as if you are a child, as if you are harmless and innocent, and this is often true, that uh, disorganized attached folks can often feel safe with children and with pets because they don't feel endangered by them. There is a kind of connection, a kind of gentleness. And then finally feeling that that the partner can be released into the right environment. And if we love mm -hmm. someone with that attachment mm -hmm. style, you hope that they will be happy, that they yeah. will be freed into something that is better for them than the relationship mm -hmm. could carry. So that's one fantasy that I just have about the dream. Yeah. What uh, I'm uh, building on what you said, Joseph, that there was the partner relationship and also this terrible relationship with her boss, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, another relational conflict, difficulty, and just so very painful. Um, she said she had a terrible boss who pressured her to recover faster and humiliated her when she asked for help. So I'm... There's certainly the relational component that you've been uh, lifting up. What I noticed is very hopeful in the dream. First, there was a part about overthrowing an oppressive regime by undermining a female associate of the dictator. Mm -hmm. So the dream starts with something that's not elaborated on, but something oppressive has been overthrown. So that's the first scene or the or the you know the what we see off stage as uh the dream setting and then in the next part she does the hard hard work 
the hard work of this journey with shark skin. She says it, it folded over. The shark is comatose. Uh, she walked for days, sometimes having to put it on a rod to hang it on. It was a heavy task. A and our dream ego is feeling both love and fear. Uh, she feels a whole mixture of feelings. You know, then she has the children and the teacher. But it feels like, now the dream says, this is a really arduous journey. And she makes the journey. And it's coming to an end. And she's going to release the shark back into the wilds of the archetypal sea where it belongs, not in her personal life. So, you know, this is, a, this is a little bit of a quest dream. She has yeah. a quest yeah. to fulfill and it's arduous and it's difficult. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think we could relate it to other, you know, archetypal quest stories that we might know about. And what, what I'm aware of is, uh, that that um this shark is some kind of image of uh an aspect of her an aspect yeah. of her instinctual life sharks and this maybe can inform the previous dream that we talked about as well sharks are ancient they're you know kind of consummate predators they live in the open ocean so they are also kind of denizens of the unconscious so they they are mysterious, they are powerful, and they are aggressive. And so what aspect of the dreamer's psyche might have become comatose or desiccated through these various things that she's talked about, the relationship mm -hmm. with the boss, the partner, the stepfather, and somehow needs to be restored Mm. And 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 vivified and and put back in right relationship, you know. Uh, I, I I of course th that's always hugely a part of any dream of that. E Jung is pretty clear that everything in the dream almost always is a part of the dreamer. But what I'm going back to is that that part of her and that part of a relational dynamic is being set free to go back into the archetypal realm. So, you know, I kind of wonder about our dreamer's own history where archetypal forces uh, that we haven't been able to process, perhaps as children, uh, then uh, become intruders in our lived daily world. And can't really be humanized. You can't humanize a shark. You can't turn it into a pet. Uh, and so we have to let what belongs to the great mother, the great sea, the wild, mystery or mysterious oceans. We have to turn it back to that. It belongs in its own realm. Well, and, and to maybe just sum up, um, in the first dream, we have people in the shark infested waters. They don't, <laughs> people don't belong in shark infested waters. And in the, the second dream, we have a shark that is uh, sort of existing on, on dry land. And, and both somehow are not the, the, the instinctual unconscious and the and conscious personality yeah. are somehow not in right relationship mm -hmm. with each other. And uh, right. Maybe, that land maybe and sea that. have their separate realms and, and need to stay separate. There's a boundary, you know, we clearly recognize it when it's land and sea, but when creatures from the land jump into the sea, it's not a fit. And when feature creatures from the sea are somehow being carried around on the land, things are not in right order. Yeah. I also want to lean in a little bit to what you'd said, Deb, about this being archetypal, because often, well, not often, but we can be under the sway of a very 
potentiated archetypal matrix. And then mm -hmm. we can feel both inflated and compelled parts of our humanity are pushed away. Other very narrow elements of the personality are brought forward. What we would hope, which I think has happened very constructively in the dream from that perspective, is that the archetype has become deflated. If mm -hmm. we think about the inflated shark, mm -hmm. great white shark is, you know, like, I don't know, several mm -hmm. tons. But now it's, it's deflated that she can actually carry the archetype. It's burdensome, but it's mm -hmm. doable. This can happen in an analysis when we become aware that an archetype has been unduly influencing us. And as we study it and come into more knowledge about it, it does begin to deflate. It begins to go back to the unconscious, to its mythic um, world. And I think quite so, she may have been, she may have come aware of something, and she is in this process of um, detaching or separating away from her identification mm -hmm. with whatever the shark symbolized, and that it has been a great labor as it is with yeah. kind of self-reflective work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you to both of these dreamers. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.